Hello, everybody. We want to study today from uh, Psalm chapter 2. And um, so we're at the beginning of uh, the year 2024. This is one of um, a few major words that I think we need to set in place for this year to know where we are at the kingdom of God. Uh, another one is we have to have a Christology of the end times. Another one is we have to understand Israel and the church coming together. Another one is we have to understand a theology of war and the kingdom. But today, I want to go over this uh, special message, which I am calling uh, Zion Controversy, or Controversy over Zion. Uh, let's look at this. So in Psalm chapter 2, the Hebrew here is very poetic. Why are the Gentiles or the nations upset? And why are the nations imagining Empty things. And the, the kings of the earth will take their stand together and the princes will uh, take advice together against Adonai and against his Messiah. Two things that they're opposing there. And it says, and we will cut off our the things that are binding us and we will throw throw away from us every heavy cord yoshev bashamayim yishak and he who sits in the heavens will laugh adonai yil aglamo and the lord will will uh, ridicule them as yidaber elemo ba'apo u vecharono yivalemo and then he will speak to them in his anger and in his wrath he will Terrify them, Yivalemu. So it's really the same root for the modern word for panic today, Bahala. Ani, the Ani Nasakti Malki Al Sion Har Kochi. And I have poured out, set my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Asapra el Hok Adonai Amar Elai Bni Atta Ani Hayom Yilidvicha. It says, and I will declare. The law, the Lord has said unto me, You are my son, and this day I have uh, given birth to you. He says, Ask from me, and I will give you the nations, the Gentile nations, as an inheritance and as a possession to the ends of the earth. And you will uh, shepherd them with a rod of iron. Kichli yotzer tinapsem, and with uh, the uh, a, a, a tool of a yotzer uh, potter, you will s- smash them to pieces. Veata malachim haskilo, and you now, you kings, you better get wise. He vasru shufte aritz, and you judges of the earth, you better take your uh, discipline. If do et Adonai biyira, serve the Lord in fear. Gilu bir adda, and rejoice with trembling. Nashku var penye enough, and kiss the son lest he be angry. Vitovdu derech ki yivar kimat apo ashri kol chosvebo. And it says, and um, and you will be lost. <laughs> you will perish uh, in the way it, it, for his anger. Is just about to burn upon you, but blessed are those who who trust in the Lord. Amen. All right, uh, pretty intense passage. Oof. And he starts out with, "I want to start." I was really just meditating on this first word. Why? 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 Look around the world today, and you see yourself. Why is this happening? Is the world going crazy? Why? What's going on here? Why are all the nations upset? What's going on? Now, Ragshu here is a type of emotion, but it's in this case, he means a negative emotion. God's given us emotions. We can use those emotions for good or for bad. So here it means negative emotions. The whole, all the nations are upset and everybody's imagining things that are just empty. What are they imagining? You know what? I look around the world today, you go, what is going on? How could this be happening? How could all the nations, the United Nations, all they do is vote against Israel? Like, you don't have anything else to do? 
every single vote they've ever taken to condemn it is just against Israel. How could that be? Academics, high-level academics are making up all kinds of weird theories of, of, of how do you co actually condemn exactly the wrong people all the time. How are, how are ultra-liberals defending uh, ultra-radical jihadist terrorist extremists? What is going on with you? What's happening? Doesn't make any sense. Why? And then he says, for the kings are standing up. Now, the word, it doesn't use the word rebellion here. But the answer to the why question to all of these is they're standing up against him and they're breaking their cords off. The breaking the cords off are in rebellion. These cords are calling for submission. And, and so really what he's saying, it doesn't use the word really here, authority or rebellion. But these are all symbols of authority. And the actions of people are actions of rebellion. So we want to say why, why is all this happening? Is because people are rebelling against God's authority. That's what's happening. This is not a political situation. It's not a logical situation. It's not a moral situation. It's not an academic situation. All that is just imagining, imagining vain things, getting upset. It's crazy. But what it is, is the people of the world wanting to rebel against God's authority. Now, so rebellion here is a key. And God wanting to establish his authority is the other key. So God, now people, now why are people rebelling? There's something in human nature, maybe you never noticed that. There's something in our nature that wants to rebel. No matter what the authority is, we don't, we just, we're against it. That's, that's human nature. You rebel against authority. And the ultimate authority is God's authority. So the nature of human beings is to rebel against human authority. Now, what, why is that? What, what makes people want to rebel? Well, three things, what I call SSS. Sin, selfishness, and Satan. You know, it's our want to do something wrong. It's our own selfishness. Me, 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 I, 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 I. And satanic inspiration that he's against God. Those three things, sin, selfishness, and, and satanic influence, are what cause us to want to rebel. Everybody's got that in them. You know, it's, it's in your flesh there. You know, you have, to, you have to overcome that to want to come and, and submit to the Lord's good authority. And the Lord is coming and bringing his authority and he's, and he's challenging us to, uh, to submit to it. Now, everybody says, I want freedom. I want freedom. I want, listen, it's not a question whether you, you want freedom. You have freedom whether you like it. It's scary. Because if you have freedom of choice, then the necessity of that is that you have to give accountability for what you chose. You want freedom? I, you ought to be running away from freedom. You know? Your freedom is, 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 God demands for you to have freedom. He says, I'm going to give you freedom of choice. Here the choice is in front of you. You need to make your choice. And at the end of your choice, you have to take responsibility for your choice. You see that? If you didn't have the power to make the choice, then you wouldn't be responsible for it. But since you have the power to make the choice and you're responsible for that choice, and you will either be rewarded or punished for that. I want my freedom. Hey, buddy, you got your freedom. The question is, what are you doing with it? And or do you realize that freedom, when you're making choices, you have your choice? The question is, what results are you going to and who and what accountability, what reward or punishment are you going to get for those choices that you want to make? Well, I want to have freedom to decide what sex I am, okay? That decide what sex you want to be. But you're going to have to give an account for that. You're going to have to give an account. Is that choice right or wrong? You can choose whatever you want to do. But, you can, but when you get done with those choices, there's going to be judgment and you're going to have to be, repunish, you'll be punished or rewarded. God is demanding us. He's not allowing us to have freedom. He's demanding us to have freedom because he's demanding for us to make choices and have accountability for that. Woo! Now, so he gives us that, and, and we're using that in the wrong way. Now, and then he says, he says, now I want to, I, I have authority over you. You have to come and submit to me. So I give you that free will. You have to come and you choose to use your free will to overcome selfishness, sin, and satanic influence, and you choose to submit to God's will and his authority. Why? Because you check it all out and you realize 
He's the only good authority. <laughs> so you want to you submit to something that's good. God is good. He is perfect. He has a plan. What I say? He has a perfect plan for a perfect world with perfect people. And so we choose to submit to God's perfect plan for a perfect world with perfect people. The Bible calls that the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a perfect world with perfect people. And so we choose to submit to that. We choose to come under his authority. Now, if you're going to have a perfect world, would you like to be in a perfect world with perfect people? Sure. So how are we going to do that? You have to have somebody that's all powerful and good and perfect himself to run it. Thank God we have that. God. But now how is he going to make that work with us? If you're going to have a perfect world, you're going to have to have a perfect leader in that. And that leader, if it's going to be of human beings, it's got to be a perfect human being. So you've got to choose who you're going to submit to. And so God says, I've chosen one human being who is the one perfectly righteous human being. And I'm saying, Here's, this is the way my perfect world starts because I've got a perfect leader of it. And you can choose to submit to him. And he says there's going to be a real kingdom on this earth. Every kingdom has to have a capital and every kingdom has to have a king. You got that a perfect world or a kingdom has to have a capital and a king. So the king of that kingdom is Yeshua. He's the only perfect human being. If you weren't sure, he's the only person that's ever been raised from the dead. So the, the choices should be easy. You know, there isn't really any other Jesus or, you know, the Baba Cherevi or Muhammad. I mean, that's basically, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, there's not that much there. So, so, you know, so you have to make a choice. You choose to submit to him. But people don't want that. Not for any good reason. Why don't you want to? No, Bali. You know, I don't want to. That's what, one of the first words I learned in Hebrew is katef sorerin. That's a, that's a rebellious shoulder. I don't want to. You know, that's what, Israeli kids learn that about the age of eight months. But anyway, so, uh, but, uh, where was I? So he sets this king in there. So he says, this world, I got a perfect world. And it's got to have all kinds of leaders, but you got to have one to start the leadership with it. And that is Yeshua. So I've chosen this person. And people rebel again. They don't want to submit to Yeshua, not because he's wrong. I mean, you, if you really tell everybody in the earth, if you had to submit to someone, who would you choose? Well, like everybody would choose Jesus. It's not that you don't want him. It's just you don't want to submit to anybody. You know? And so and that's it. But he's got a kingdom. And if he's got a kingdom, the, every kingdom has a capital city. And the capital city, he says here, is Zion. It's Zion. It's Jerusalem. It's interesting that in Hebrew, the word is actually Zion, which means a signpost. So a capital city it's not, it's, it's not the geography that is the most important, although the geography has an important. It is a sign of his authority, the capital city. So if you say Jerusalem, you're talking about the government of Israel. If you say Washington, you're talking about the government of America. If you're talking about Beijing, you're talking about the government of, of, uh, of China. But here you're talking about Zion, Jerusalem as the capital, not just of Israel as a state, but it's God's capital. That's the place he chose. No, he said you could, he could have chosen another place. You say, well, I don't like that choice. Well, I'm sorry, folks. That's not your choice. He said, I'm going to set up a perfect world with perfect people. It's going to have a perfect government with a perfect leader is Yeshua. And I'm going to put a capital in there. And then I've chosen that capital, which is my holy hill, which is Jerusalem, which is Zion. So what's going on is people don't want that. It's not that they're really against. It's not that they're really against Jerusalem or Zion. They're against the the. the the idea that there would be a place that you have to submit to. Why should I have to come to submit to that? And so people get angry at that. And they don't want it, but it's a, it's a spirit of rebellion that comes. And God says, look, I said, I've set my king on my holy hill. So the, the beginning to have a perfect world with perfect people is a submission to that perfect person and a submission to the capital of his kingdom, which is Jesus, Yeshua, and Zion. And so what happens around the world today is there's a, a rebellion against that. And we have to look at this. These are spiritual sources of all these. It doesn't make any sense. Not logically, not academically, not politically, not historically. None of that makes any sense. It's a spiritual rooted rebellion against the plan of God. 
and it is demonic. Now, I see our people coming to the stage of just, they're, they're becoming proud in a good sense, fighting for the sake, fighting for the right of Zion as a city, as a nation, as the, as the, as the gods reestablishing the nation, the people of Israel and Zion in these end times. Our people are starting to fight for that in, in, in a good way. Not perfectly good, but it's basically fighting for God's right. But they don't want Yeshua yet. They will. They'll see it sometime. They're just starting to see it. It's amazing. We're seeing some writing of some, not even faith yet, but saying, you know, how are we going to stand? The only way we're going to stand against propaganda against Israel is we need to reclaim the Jewish identity of Jesus, and that will protect our right to be able to be. Come on. That's halfway there. You know, it's going to. So, but our people are, are fighting for Zion, but they're missing, they're missing the king. I mean, I'd rather get the king, if I had to choose the king or the capital, I'd rather get the king right and miss the capital. But you've got to get both of them because he's coming back to bring his kingdom here. Now, in the believing Christian world, I'm talking about those who have been, believe the scriptures, believe in Yeshua, submit to him, are born again and serving his lordship, and they have him. But some of them are being blinded to the fact of this issue of Zion, of Jerusalem, of what's going, what is God's plan for this nation? Now, one, now, maybe that was okay for most of the past 2,000 years because Israel wasn't here. What difference does it make? It's a theological question. But now Israel's here. And it didn't make a difference. Listen, it didn't make a difference before because Yeshua wasn't getting ready to come back. So whether he's going to come back to New York or to Beijing or Jerusalem, what difference does it make? Or whether he's not going to come back, he'll come halfway back and then go back up to heaven, you know, get confused, whatever. But uh, it, that, it didn't make any difference. But now we're getting the time where the plane's got to come into the airport. So now the airport's becoming important. He's got to have the landing place. If you're not ready to land, it doesn't make any difference. If you're getting ready to land, then that place becomes important. The place of Yeshua coming back becomes essential to his authority, not just his lordship, but now he's coming back to establish his lordship. Oh, it's easy to say, Lord Yeshua. No, man, no, he's coming back to establish his lordship. Oh, wait a minute, I don't want any of that. That sounds political. It, you know, what are you submitting to? But I feel, you know, I mean, uh, what are you talking about? So he's coming back to bring his perfect world, which needs authority in it so it can, it can stand right, and, and people are rejecting that. But I believe now is the time when the, the people of Israel are beginning to see that potentially true believing Christians are their friends in the world and part of who we are. And the Christian world is beginning to see, wait a minute, we've been singing for, you know, the, our whole life, you know, Lion of the Tribe of Judah. Well, whoa, no, he's coming as a Lion of the Tribe of Judah. We, we, we were just singing that. We didn't really mean it, you know. I mean, it's like, what? He's coming. What are you dealing with here? We find, and God is, is, is bringing the two together at this point. One of the great ways that he's doing that is through Israeli Christian Arabs and Israeli Messianic Jews. That's, the, that's, the, that's the, 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 the center point of the linking of bringing the two together with this. That's amazing. Now, all right, let's go on. He says, um, uh, we're up in verse 7 already. And he says, uh, you know, you are my son. It's interesting. Now, notice that he says, my Messiah, my King, my son. Those are three descriptions of Yeshua. He's God's King. He's God's anointed one. And he's God's son. So those three go together. The anointed one has got to be a king because God is setting up a perfect society. But he's also got to be a son because he's setting up a family. We're a family and a society. We're a family and a kingdom. So Yeshua is the lead of that. He is the son of God that begins the family of God. And he is the king of God's kingdom that sets up God's uh, um, society upon the earth. And so we receive him as both. So this is my anointed, my king, my son, all in one psalm. Way to go, David. All right. Now, um, but that, that becomes what people uh, uh, want to rebel against. And so you say, what does a super liberal United Nations or academic world or super liberal media, what, how, why are they teaming together with an ultra extremist jihadist uh, is Islamic world, what have they got to? I mean, 
Why is CNN supporting Al Qaeda? I mean, what, like, what is, it's crazy. What is the common denominator? Excuse me for saying, Mom, but this is what it says here. Because, because they don't want the authority of Yeshua or the kingdom of God or Zion coming. And God said, okay, I've given you guys a couple thousand years to debate about this. And now it's getting ready for the time to me to implement it. So the time of discussion is getting to the end. And frankly, God is angry. I'm not making that up. That says here, it's got all kinds of words for anger here. I mean, it just, he's, he's angry about this situation. He's angry about the people rebelling on both sides. He's coming to make, the, he's coming to bring his kingdom. Do we have a belief that we don't even believe that God can be angry? That you don't believe that God will ever bring judgment on anybody at any time? Do we have a Santa Claus God? Is that what we're talking about? It's not what it is. It's not in the Bible. Don't want to get upset. Okay. Um, now, he says here, it's interesting. He says, now, ask me of the nations and I will give them to you. It's interesting that God has to tell him to ask. I see that there's something about, he's talking to Yeshua. He says, now, you ask me of the nations and I will give them to you as an inheritance. But I, what I see is that Yeshua doesn't even really have an ambition. It's like he's not even looking to. He's like, he just loves God, loves people. You know, we want to be in the same heart as him. You know, he says, God says, ask me, I want, to, I, want, I want to put you in a position of authority over the nations, but you need to want to do it, Yeshua. I wonder if that was personally for him a struggle, you know? He said, I just came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. God says, ask me for all the Gentile nations. Well, okay, you know, that's not what, maybe it, I'm, I'm joking a little bit, but I'm saying there's a, there's a changing of heart to receive the nations. The people of Israel, the Jewish people, have to receive the nations, and the nations have to do the same. Change your heart to receive, to receive Israel. There's a change on both the Jewish side and the Christian side to receive one another. And one of the things that's present, preventing that is plain old jealousy. Jealousy. Well, if, if I recognize Zion, that means I recognize all the biblical promises about the land are true. That means the biblical promises to the Jewish people are true. That means you're still chosen. That means who do you think you are? I'm offended at that thought. Well, that's just jealousy, you know. And you know why the Jewish people want to receive Jesus? For the same reason. Because if we, if we come to know Yeshua, that means, what are you talking about? I mean, like the Gentiles were right for 2,000 years and we missed our own Messiah and they're the chosen people and we missed it? Jealousy, you know? It's like the sons of Leah and the sons of Rachel were jealous of one another, you know, for the, you got chosen you didn't sleep with my mom and you didn't, I mean, you know, come on, guys. Everybody's jealous of everybody else and we just hate everyone. Cut it out, you know? We just bless, give, you know? We, God's got infinite supply. You don't have to be jealous of somebody else. He can give you more. But there's something for us here to want. We said, ask me. I think so that means of the, the Israel to ask him of the nations. Say, we love the nations. We want to be together with the nations. And for us particularly, we want to be together with our Arab brothers and sisters. We want that. And then the reverse is true. And the international world is saying, no, we're not, we're not jealous of this. Thank God that God chose someone and, and, and the, his plan is going forward. We're not jealous. We want to embrace you. We want you to be part of that. Instead of being jealous of one another, we share what our inheritance is with one another and we, and we join together for the kingdom of God. All right. And he says, I'm um, going to uh, jump over some. He says, okay, you know, you need, to, you need to serve the Lord. You need to worship him and kiss the son lest he be angry with you. There's another word for anger there. Now, one other thing there, he says there too, if you're going to rule them with a rod of iron. I, it's a hard verse for me to get that. I mean, I thought that, you know, this is a kingdom of love. You know, well, I just went, but actually I see hope in that. Because if he's saying if he's going to be strong, it means like there's a place in the kingdom, not just for people that are absolutely perfect. You know what I'm saying? It's not just, you know, Jesus, John, Peter, Paul, and Betty. You know, I mean, there's a place for me in there too because God's going to, you know, bring his authority. He'll set up a kingdom in which he's going to exercise his authority so, so the, his, his rule will help establish his righteousness. It's actually a good thing. You know, he's saying, I want, I'm, going to, I'm going to exercise my authority 
because I'm not just going to let it all be on your personal good, on your personal choices. I'm going to come and bring my authority. It's helpful to the children when the father's exercising authority. It's helpful to the government when the government is exercising authority. And he's saying, I'm the son of God. I'm the king of God's kingdom. And I'm going to exercise authority for your good. So you go, whew, okay. Now it's amazing. This verse is quoted three times in the book of Revelation. Three times in the book of Revelation. Chronologically, not according to the script, but chronologically, the first time it is, it's in Revelation 12. Don't look at it up there, I'll quote it for it. Revelation 12, in which you see Yeshua as a baby. And it says, this is the baby who was born, who was destined to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That's how we believe in Yeshua now. He's not ruling in this world right now. He's, he's the one who was born to be the king of the Jews. But then, in Revelation 2, talking to the community of faith, the ecclesia, the church, the believers, he's saying, no, I'm transferring this to you. It's not just him. He's saying, but you will rule the nations together with me with a rod of iron. If you submit to me, then you get delegated authority. Submission to authority has authority delegated to you. You with me? So he said, he's the child destined. If you believe that, then you receive the right of ruling and reigning together with him with integrity and authority. Wow! But then there's a third time in Revelation 19. And that's when he comes down in anger to trample out the, the grapes of the wrath of God and strike the nations of the world who have come in rebellion against God. And what is going to be the sign of their ultimate rebellion? A united international global attack against Jerusalem. That is the ultimate expression of rebellion. Why? Our people are not going to understand it. They don't understand it today. We don't get it. Why is everybody against us? What's going on here? Because it's an attack against Yeshua. It is a satanic attempt to stop the coming of the kingdom of God. That's what it's all about. And Christians, you can't have Yeshua without his kingdom, which is based in Israel. And Israel, you can't have your kingdom without the Messiah, who is Yeshua. We're going to have to deal with that and come together and submit to his plan. Now, as, when all these nations come to attack, then he will come and strike them and destroy them in a war, in a war. And he will come to wage war and to make judgment. I'm quoting the Bible. Don't blame me for that. He's coming back. So what you see in Psalm 2 is it's describing God's emotions. He's saying, I'm angry at what's happening and I'm going to come at some time and some place to, to bring this and stop this rebellion. And when is it going to happen? All the way toward the end of the Bible in Revelation 19 when Yeshua comes back leading an army as the commander of the army of heaven and of Israel and come back and destroy the nations that have fought against Israel. And whether you not, like it or not, it will be Jesus coming back to defend Jerusalem. It will be Yeshua coming back to defend Jerusalem. So if you want Yeshua, you don't want Jerusalem, tough luck. If you want Jerusalem, you don't want Yeshua, tough luck. You know, that's his plan. It's his world. That's his kingdom. And that's what he is coming back to establish upon the earth. Hallelujah. And I just pray that we will begin to see what's going on in the world today in spiritual terms. We're not politicians. I don't know whether I'm left or right. I don't want to be left or right. I just want to, I want to submit to him. I want to be straight, you know. We're for righteousness. And we want to just, we want, to, we want people to get for the believers to see this thing in spiritual terms. Is it what's going on now? One last word and then we'll pray. You know, people say, well, what? we say, why are you being, everybody? this is like a, the most popular word today is to be anti-Zionist. We say, how can you be anti-Zionist? You know, it's a, if you're a believer, I mean, it's, it's all over the Bible. What Bible do you believe in? Well, I'm not for all their political. I'm not for all their political policies. Who said you had to be for the political party policies? Do you think that's what Al Qaeda and Boko Haram and Hezbollah and Ayatollahs and Shiites and, and, and Hamas they want? They they're looking for a perfect political thing. No, that's not what it says. This war had nothing to do with the rights of the people in Gaza. I didn't say that. Sinwar said it. Sinwar said it. He said this war is a flood against El Aqsa. This is a war to wipe out the people of Israel and exterminate them. That's what this war is about, you know. 
So, is that the anti-Zionism that you believe in? That's satanic. That's not of God. You don't talk about our politics? We don't agree with one another politics. I don't know two Israelis that believe about politics anyway. I don't agree with all Israeli politics. Well, neither do we. Who God, we, nobody believes it. Nobody agrees about anything. That's not what we're asking for. We're asking for the right of people to exist so that Yeshua can come back and establish his kingdom on the earth. Amen. Father, we pray right now. I pray for, Lord, and forgive me if I said anything the wrong way, but Lord, I pray help people to filter it out and get the right part of it, Lord, to get your heart in some two, setting up a standard of God's government and authority that's getting closer to the earth, Lord, and that you're about to stop the rebellion of all the peoples on the earth. Lord, help us to have a submitted heart and help us to stand with you at this time, Lord God, and not be afraid. Hallelujah. Because, Lord, you're not afraid. In fact, you laugh at it. All the people's against me. <laughs> Tell, amen, amen, amen.